Hi, everyone. Am Amen here, your CFWC president, and welcome to today's CFWC Executive Committee Recipe Swap for our workshop between 3 and 4 p.m. We're so happy to have you here. This meeting is being recorded and posted on Facebook, and you can find us on Facebook at GFWC California Federation of Women's Clubs. After that, it goes to our YouTube channel, which you have directions for on that same Facebook page. So I'm gonna put you on pause until we get ready to start. And until then, stick around, grab a snack, get a drink. It's gonna be fun today. Bye. So we're recording, ladies. Hello. Thank you for coming to our CFWC Executive Committee Recipe Swap. There is a PDF that will be coming out to you later today from Lynn, and um, I am just so happy to have you all here with us today. I'm going to hand it to uh, Barbara Bradley Beard, your dean, to see if she has any announcements. Just want to say welcome, everybody. We're going to have fun in the next hour. Oh, I unmuted myself. Excellent. Well, there's quite a few of us today. One of the things that was requested was that we have a recipe swap. How do you do that with close to 11,000 members? Well, I decided we'd start small. And if we um, want to get bigger, we will. I mean, we have plenty of time. It's a great administration so far, so we will share. It being um, Women's History Month, I thought it would be fun to share recipes from our families. So I know I went back to my great grandmother who came from Vice Yugoslavia, and we're gonna be telling you a little bit about where our recipes come from and um, the history of our families. But um, just a reminder, we are videotaping. It will be on Facebook until Friday, and that is at GFWC California Federation of Women's Clubs. After that, it is on YouTube, and they tell you how to get there from Facebook. And so we will be starting our um, PowerPoint. I put it in an order where if you were going to a Yugoslavian home, which is how I was raised, Yugoslavian home, you walked in and there were a few little things that you could eat, and then you would have some hors d'oeuvres, and then you would have uh, a couple of other things like chapino and some other stuff, and then you get the pasta, and then the meat would come out, and then another main dish would come out, and so there were like 11 courses. So we're, that's kind of how I put it together. That's the order I put it because we have um, 11 people that uh, submitted 12 different recipes, and we're sharing those with you today. So um, we're going to go. I, it, in the order, here it comes. If the person can go ahead, you'll see the menu, who's gonna be first. And just let um, Sonia Holtz know, because we do have two Sonias on today. Sonia Holtz know when you would like to change your slide. You can see that we're gonna start with peanut clusters and move up to the Spam Moozy Boo, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Mother's tuna salad. Um, easy summer fruit salad and chillin' summer salad. We're gonna go to Yo Mama's marinara and spaghetti after that. Baked pasta and arroz con pollo. Did you hear that, Rita? I said it right. Oh, I've been practicing. Oma's beef, I don't know how to say this one, rouladen. Apricot cobbler, Italian biscotti, and end with tortonis. So let's start with Peanut clusters, take it away. Um, well, I really didn't, didn't think of a family recipe. My mother's side of the family has been in, in the United States since actually uh, prior to the Revolutionary War. So uh, we're basically meat and potato family. Uh, my, my father's family came from Germany and Ireland, but all of my grandparents were uh, had passed long before I ever came into the world. So um, what uh, I remember from my childhood was Christmas morning when we would get up and there would be on the table um, would be peanut clusters and um, nuts, not shelled. And so we always had that. So when I was married, that was a tradition that I started in our family also, peanut clusters. 
always went down to the store and bought them until uh, in the early 70s, um, I started making my own peanut clusters and they began, became a very big tradition that now is the favorite thing that I give everybody that I know and we eat them a lot. Um, and peanut, these are very easy to do. Um, you uh, need almond bark, which is um, very hard to get in California because the best kind to get is um, the Plymouth almond bark. You used to be able to get it at Walmart, can't find it now. And you use one pound of that, one pound of chocolate chips melted in the microwave for about three minutes, maybe less, until it's melted. Before microwaves, we used to stir it on top of the stove, but this is easier in microwaves. Add two cups of, after it's melted and stirred smooth, we add two cups of dry roasted peanuts and drop it out onto um, a, uh, I don't know if there's another slide or not, drop it out onto a cookie sheet covered with wax paper and um, click the next slide and you'll see the messy, messy picture that I sent of the, of the peanut clusters um, dropped on the, um, dropped on the uh, wax paper and then let them cool for a little bit and they're delicious to eat. Um, and uh, Pam made me think of something. We tried, uh, I have a daughter that's lactose intolerant. So we tried, um, this year we tried the, the lactose free chocolate chips on a batch of them. And I, we really couldn't tell any difference. Uh, they maybe weren't as creamy, but they were just as good and they seemed to disappear just as quickly. So that's our little thing that we do each. Well, we start at Thanksgiving and I probably make, oh, eight or 10 batches of these during the holiday season. Thank you. I wanna remind all of you, we do have, you're gonna get every single sheet of this presentation. So you don't have to be writing down so quickly. I see everybody looking down and scribbling on paper. Oh. <laughs> Ready for the next one. Okay, I think I'm up. Um, I don't know, but most of you probably know that I was born in Hawaii before it became a state. And we have a restaurant there that our family owns. It's called Ono Hawaiian Food. It's a little up from the zoo on Kapahuli Boulevard. And from Lomi Lomi Salmon to Poi, I'm not so crazy about that. But anyway, I chose my favorite. My favorite is Spam because everybody in Hawaii eats Spam almost every day. But Valerie, for you, just so that you know, the first thing you do is you take your bottle of dark red wine and you pour yourself a glass because you're going to be sipping your wine while you're making your Savannah Musabi and you have your chocolate. You, so you have both of your things while you're doing this. Um, the ingredients now, so that you can get everything in the United States here, stateside Costco Sam's Club. I buy my seaweed in packages like this, and there are 12 of them, and you get them at Costco for about $5, or you can get them at places like um, Sam's Club. And I don't know if all of you are crazy about seaweed, but they'll come in little pieces like this, or they'll come in great big pieces. The other things you're going to need, of course, are Spam, and you can buy them for $5 if you wanna buy one can, or you can buy 10 of them for $20 at Sam's Club, and that's what we usually do. You have to have rice vinegar, you have to have soy sauce, and then it calls for oyster sauce. A lot of places don't carry that. So from the grocery outlet, I get a barbecue glaze. It's only a couple of bucks, and that's what we use when we're doing ours. What you're going to do is take a frying pan about yay size, like this, and oh yeah, you're going to cut up all your shabam, and you're going to put some of your little sauces in there, and you want to fry your shabam with the sauce and your glaze on it just a little bit on each side so that it tastes good. Then you have to do your rice. So I choose jasmine rice. You can buy it for a dollar or two dollars, almost anywhere. You're gonna put in two, one cup of rice to two cups of water and microwave it for 10 minutes. I just use a plain old corningware. Just one of these, a corningware bowl so that I can make my rice and then just let it sit afterwards while it's doing its thing. So now you have everything ready and you're gonna take your seaweed 
and you're gonna put the rice in there. How about next slide too, Sonia? Oh, that's good. And you put the rice and you put a piece of Spam on the top. And sometimes like when I do it, I wanna use the seaweed and wrap it around. Well, how are you gonna make it stick when there's these little flat things? So secret from the restaurant, right? You are gonna use a sponge that has water on it. This is just for my husband and I, so I could go like that. But you'll just use a sponge with water and just get it wet on the edges. And when you press it together, then the seaweed will stay together. So you just wrap it around and you have to have the soy sauce because you've got to dip it on the plate. We're gonna have it for Easter this year because um, we're having company come. So we have all our Easter stuff already and we just serve everything on plain white dishes. And I told Pam that I'm gonna bring some in September. If you guys send me an email, I'll make some and bring it when I come to the fall boards. And that concludes my recipe. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, she's putting it together there. <laughs> and then I ate them all myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I nearly choked when we, when I heard about our recipe exchange, because I'm not much of a cook and I, um, I, I'm, my mother was either, but, uh, uh, I could, I must have not have starved because I, I was 410 and 140 pounds. So, but uh, one thing I remember from my childhood is this, uh, tuna salad that she used to make. And I've never had it. Um, maybe some of you have, I've never had it anywhere else. And I, and I like it and my, and my husband would eat it. So he'd eat anything, but I, you know, I would take a can of your big can of albacore tuna, a can of peas, lasur I like, and, uh, to the sliced olives with pimento to taste and just mix it all up with mayonnaise. And uh, I took it, I made it recently and took it to a, a Yahtzee game and my uh, lady friends uh, all sampled it and they thought they liked it. And they, but they, the one thing that I hadn't done before and I'm going to try next time is put some uh, water chestnuts in it for a little crunch. So then I, as I uh, said, maybe uh, sometime, some, some, uh, some night this summer, you won't know what to fix for dinner and you might try it. So may, maybe it'll be part of your repertoire <laughs> going forward. And that's all I have to say about it. All right. We're now going to make two of the easiest summer salads you can possibly imagine. And my family loves them. Uh, the first one is a very easy summer fruit salad. And for that, you need a can, one can. And I use Dole because they have the best pineapple. One can of Dole pineapple chunks Buy them with, with the, in the juice, not the syrup. One can of Dole mandarin orange slices and one fresh banana. Super easy. So here's the how-to. Chill both cans of fruit unopened in the can. Just before you eat, get out a pretty bowl. I like my blue Pyrex clear bowl. Drain the mandarin oranges and put them in the bowl. Next, drain the pineapple chunks. Don't throw out the juice. Save it for, uh, for something. Now you're gonna add the pineapple chunks. Next, peel and slice your banana. Don't matter. You're gonna put that can of green beans in the refrigerator, unopened, and let it chill. About an hour before you eat, get your pretty bowl. Again, my favorite blue Pyrex. And I drain the green beans, put them in the bowl. Next, I cut the grape or cherry tomatoes in half, put them in the bowl. Add about a half a cup of Italian dressing, 
to that to the green beans and tomatoes mix it well put it back in the fridge and stir once or twice uh before you eat you know you're just you're just making sure the dressing is on everything okay now it's time to eat with your favorite barbecue masterpiece here's some variations that we've done over the years um if you take a slice of red onion, quarter it, separate it, and put that in with your tomatoes and green beans, uh, and maybe a half a stalk of celery, bite-sized pieces cut up. And I like to do put cucumber. Um, and you all know the trick about not getting a bitter cucumber. You before you cut your cucumber, you look at the end and determine which end was attached to the plant. You cut down about an inch, inch and a quarter. Take that piece you've cut off, rub that, rub the rest of the cucumber on the sliced end and rub it for a little bit. Discard that thing that you cut off. Cut your uh, cucumber and peel it and I like to use about a three or four inch section of cucumber. I quarter it. And here's a tip. I cut the seeds off so that the cucumber doesn't come back and, and visit you all night long. So mix all that together. And this becomes, if you have some of your favorite salad greens, put those in a bowl. Put some of your green beans, tomatoes, and uh, Italian dressing over your greens, and you have an instant salad. And, you know, my family, we just went to my son's house the other night. We had green bean salad with the, with the barbecued and smoked turkey and chicken. So it's marvelous, super easy, and my family loves it. Thank you. It's my turn next. And I like to say, I don't cook much, but I really do like to eat. <laughs> so I look, I, uh, I look for something very easy to prepare at most times. So today, uh, my favorite recipe is described as spaghetti with marinara sauce. I happened to find uh, your, your mama's marinara sauce at uh, the grocery outlet. It has burgundy wine in it, so that was attractive. It also has all fresh ingredients and it uses tomato sauce as a base. So what you do is you buy your uh, spaghetti noodles Sometimes I substitute these for those little spiral noodles that you get. And I, I substitute that because when you use the spiral noodles, the, the sauce covers all of the noodle and it sticks to the whole, uh, whole noodle so the, uh, the sauce doesn't slide off. The preparation is very easy. You pour the marinara sauce in a pot and heat it until it's hot and you boil the, the noodles in hot water for about eight min minutes until it's soft. And then you're ready to eat. To eat it, you get a plate. You put a portion of the noodles on the plate. You spoon the sauce over the noodles. You pour yourself a glass of wine and you're ready to eat. And you eat to your heart's desire over and over again. I had a plate saved so that I could demonstrate how appetizing it is. But it seems that my husband ate that uh, plate that I had for today's demo for his lunch today. So I don't have that. But thank you for letting me uh, share my recipe with you. Back to you, Pam. Okay. Here I am 
Now, what I want to what I want to point out to you first is you see on my counter I have two recipe boxes. And um, my husband had asked me this Christmas what I would like from him. And I, he's a woodworker, so I asked him to make me two new recipe boxes because mine were falling apart. And as you can see, they turned out absolutely gorgeous. So now they proudly sit on my countertop. So that was uh, the one thing. Now, with this recipe that I chose, baked pasta with tomatoes, portobello mushrooms and prosciutto. This is a go-to recipe that you want if you're gonna have a dinner party. The main reason is because you can make the whole thing the night before and just stick it in your refrigerator and you don't have, and then you just cook it that day so you're still with all your guests and everything. You follow the directions. What you do is with any, with any recipe, you first assemble all your ingredients and you do the proportions that you need. The, the mushrooms, you'll, you'll, you'll take, you'll clean them, slice them, so, and you'll have them all ready. So you just be able to dump while you're cooking. It sounds, it sounds like there's a lot of work, but it's a very easy recipe, actually, as long as you do everything step by step and you have all your ingredients assembled, then you'll be able to um, put this dish together very easily. And voila, you, trust me, you serve this with a nice green salad, some bread and some wonderful red wine and you'll, your guests will love you. Did you get to see the picture of the finished product? Because that's all of the, there's the finished product. It's beautiful. And that's it. Hi, everybody. The recipes so far sound really well, very well prepared, very good. For this recipe, the best thing to do is to start by putting four chicken breasts or thighs or wings. They're not like buffalo wings, just wings. And if you, the reason I say four is because I cook for two. And so four seems to be enough. Um, but you want to do that uh, way ahead before you're going to begin preparing this. So you get those four chicken breasts into about four cups of water. And I show a little pan there um, so that you can see what four cups of water looks like. And that, um, yeah, I mean, but that's what your chicken is in. Okay, so it's in a pot boiling. And then it, this is about 30 minutes before you're going to prepare your food. So it's boiling over there on the side. And then once it's ready, you're going to pour four cups of the chicken broth into a pan that size, a little small one. So four cups of chicken broth. And then you have your tomato sauce, not paste. So you're gonna pour your tomato sauce into that chicken broth that you have prepared. Your chickens are in that other pan and they're ready to go when you're ready. And then the next thing you're gonna do, I think it's next slide, is and then you're going to take two thirds cup of oil and you're going, that's, that's the wrong one, two thirds cup of oil with the rice. And this is how big my pan is. And so that's the size of the pan that I used. And you will put the two thirds cup of oil and then you're gonna put two cups of rice into the oil. And you're gonna slowly start to do, I don't know if you can see me cause it doesn't show me that you see me, but you're gonna slowly start going like that with it, like simmer, you know, just kind of moving it around. And you wanna let it get, toasty but not not overcooked just brown brown it once you do that you've got to be ready so your sauce your chicken broth is in the pot just in front of you and it's boiling and it's simmering and it's important to make sure that you taste test it so that it tastes nice and chicken brothy with a little bit of tomato taste into it and then you've already cut your very, I don't know if you can see, you'll see it later. There's a can of green peas. You want to drain those. And also you want to cut your tomatoes 
and you want to cut one tomato. So I showed you the size, how little I use a very little one and a little bit of green onion. You're not using a lot. Okay, so once you've got your rice is already getting brown, now you're going to pour that chicken broth with tomato in it. And you're gonna pour it into the rice and it's gonna splash. It's gonna go like psh, real loud, but it won't get you. So then pour it in and sure it looks like it's just floating there, the, the broth with the chicken. The broth and the chicken are just floating because now you bring your chicken over, you sprinkle your peas on top, you garnish it with the green onion and the um and the tomato, and you cover and, and go back and when you open it it's all cooked it's going to look like the one on the far left and and you can see it's flour tortillas um you can serve it in the morning what you know any time day that you want to do it so but it's a delicious dish and it's from guadalajara this is from my family in guadalajara thank you very much Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Sonia Matisse and I'm going to share with you um, a recipe from my husband's family. They, my husband was born in Germany and their family has been traced back to the 13th century. So somehow or other this meal filtered down to me along with the name Oma means grandma. So uh, when I became a grandma the first time that became my, my name as well. Um, traditionally, we serve rouladen, a beef rouladen, with potato dumplings and red cabbage at our family get togethers. And it's, um, I can, well, I say this, you, it's made with the six slices of, of a top round, three slices of bacon, um, one onion slice, and some butter and mustard and pepper and, and such. You take uh, the slices of the beef and you'll put, you'll, um, <laughs> you just put a little mustard on one end, you divide some onion and, <clears throat> excuse me, and some bacon and you roll it, you roll it up and you, you um, close it up with a skewer or a um, toothpick. And then you will brown it in a frying pan and be careful, you don't want the <clears throat> each, this makes about, it makes six of these. You don't want them to be too close together. You want them to, to brown nicely. And then you will take them after, after they're browned on all sides. You'll, um, at that point, then you would be adding, adding some water to them, two cups of hot water. You pour gently over the frying pan. And then it will simmer for about an hour and a half. And then when you, you'll remove the rouladen, the, the individual pieces, and from the gravy, you'll thicken that with one to two tablespoons of cornstarch in a little cold water, stir gently, and it will, it will thicken right up and, and then season with salt and pepper and freshly ground, uh, freshly ground pepper. And if you wish, um, you can add sour cream, I usually do. So then you just remove the skewers or whatever you, Use to hold them together and, and go ahead and serve it with, um, we, as we do potato dumplings. And quite often we'll do it with a red cabbage and it makes a very hearty meal. It's, it's something that my whole family enjoys. I think they enjoy the, the potato dumplings the most perhaps sometimes because if they find the one with the almond hidden in the middle, then they get a silver dollar. And when they were little, this was a big deal. And now that they have grown and have children of their own, they still all want that almond. Sometimes we have to put a couple almonds in there, but it's, it's a great meal. It has a wonderful history coming from a small town in Germany where my husband grew up. So thank you. Good afternoon, ladies. My name is Cindy Sanders. 
And I am going to tell you a little bit today about my great grandma's apricot cobbler. And um, my ancestors also came from Germany, somewhat like the Matisse family. They came in 1866 and they were dry land farmers. They received a land grant of 200 acres from President Grant. And it's the most gorgeous handwritten document that I've ever had the privilege of holding in my hands. It's absolutely beautiful, the land grant itself. And my family and I, my cousins and my father and my uncle, we still own the 200 acres today. And it's currently being farmed in almond trees. We say almonds, you say almonds, it's all the same. Apricots, let's talk a little bit about that. So my grandmother, she loved apricots and she always wanted to have apricot trees. So when she was, oh, probably um, shortly after she was married, my great grandmother split her original 80 acres in half and gave 40 acres to my grandmother. And my grandmother immediately had the family plant apricot trees. And I was very privileged to have received that wonderful gift of 40, 40 acres of apricot trees from my grandmother before she passed. And so I keep the tradition alive and we have apricot trees still planted there. Now, my ancestors, as they came from Germany, they were dry land farmers. And so this is um, a picture of their, their um, wheat harvester. They grew wheat and barley, and it was pulled with a mule team. And this is actually Jurgen Toming. He was the original Toming to come from Germany. And this picture shows the original farmhouse that was built on the 200 acre land grant. And unfortunately the, the home is gone, but um, we, like I said earlier, we still do farm the property. So if I could get the next slide with the actual recipe, that would be fantastic. There it is. So unfortunately, because we live out in the middle of nowhere, and back then, you know, a couple hundred years ago, it was really in the middle of nowhere. So a lot of the wonderful recipes that were brought over from Germany had to be simplified and they had to be things that could be actually found in our area. So um, my great, great grandmother, she, actually had a, a lovely cobbler recipe that was a little bit more complicated, but we found that this one in its simple form is so wonderful because you can use it in so many different ways. You can use it with any type of fruit that you want. You can use it, you can make an apple mixture, you can do the, the canned pie filling that comes already pre-made. You can make your own filling by um, using whatever stone fruit you'd like or really any kind of fruit at all. And, putting your sugar and sweeten it to your own liking. And so the cobbler itself, one cup of flour, one cup of sugar, and a teaspoon of baking powder. Very easy ingredients to find. You mix those together. Then you take an egg and you put it in a bowl and you beat it. Or my little trick is I put it into a small mason jar, put the lid on and I shake it up. Then you pour it into your dry ingredients, your flour, sugar, baking powder. You mix that together. The mixture will be very crumbly. So you take that mixture and you put it over, you sprinkle it over your sliced fruits. And I'm sorry if you hear my dogs bark in the background. Obviously, there's an intruder alert. But my daughter's home, she'll take care of it. Okay, so you've sprinkled it evenly over your fruit. Now, what you're going to do next is you're going to melt a half a cup of butter. That's a whole entire cube. And you're going to put it into a... Um, I usually use something that's easy to pour with, such as a measuring cup. And so you drizzle the butter over the top that you've already placed over the fruit and you bake it. And usually it's at, there we go, thank you. Um, you bake it at 350 degrees until the filling is bubbling, the topping is golden brown, and you can serve it with vanilla ice cream or whipping cream awesome recipe. That is a, a picture of apricots from my orchard last year. And I do a lot of canning and I like to make apricot jam with those also. So, but I hope you enjoy the apricot cobbler recipe. Like I said, it could be used for any type of fruit cobbler. Enjoy. Thank you so much. It was wonderful spending the afternoon with you today.
did you want me to move over the top of this one until i'm can can you hear me well there you are gina yeah hi hi honey how are you i'm good how are you guys all right let's do you want me to start with this slide i think that i okay, think badly great. i don't have any other pictures so sure okay. why not Okay, good afternoon, ladies. Um, I would like to have been able to share my grandmother's cookies that I really loved. They are her own recipe. They are regatta cookies. And I would ask her at least a few times a year to please share the recipe with me. And she would lovingly pat me and say that God was going to tell her before she would die so she could give me the recipe. But I don't think God was in on that little secret. And uh, she left and I don't have the recipe. So I will share another favorite recipe of mine, which is Italian biscotti. Uh, it's a little labor intensive, but believe me, it's it's worth it. It's a big family favorite. Um, as you can see from the ingredients, and there uh, are directions uh, that I included with the recipe. Um, have your butter softened and then have your eggs beaten. I would, I also have all of my dry ingredients sifted together. And as you assemble the ingredients, mix them well. You add the flour mixture a little at a time. And it's surprising, it calls for six uh, teaspoons of baking powder and um, it doesn't make it really grow that much and you would think that it would. So after you have everything mixed really well, I would strongly suggest, it tells you to oil your hands, but this is very, very sticky. The batter is very sticky. So I got um, a, a box of gloves, uh, rubber medical gloves that, you know, they have in the doctor's office and those work really well. You oil the cookie sheets and, and divide it's easier for me, I divide it in half and then I divide each half again and I put two loaves on the cookie sheet. You can, it stretches and you can almost do the full length of the cookie sheet and you don't have to worry, it won't overflow. After you bake it for 20 minutes, immediately remove them and cut them as you would slices of bread and return them to the cookie sheet lying flat and bake them again, uh, you toast them for about 10, maybe 15 minutes, it depends how dark you would like them at 400 degrees. Uh, remove them and let them cool a little. You can eat them like that. Sometimes you could dip half of it in melted chocolate, but um, they're pretty good. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that it calls for, and I have to refer back to the, um, um, it calls for one and a half teaspoons of anise oil. Uh, anise oil is different than anise flavoring. The anise flavoring, you won't har hardly have any flavor to your cookies at all. So you do need to add the oil to it, but don't do any more than one and a half because uh, it'll really make you pucker up if, uh, if you put too much in. So uh, if you have any questions, give me a call and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Everything looks so good. Um, thank you, thank you, ladies, for sharing these recipes. Last night I made my, um, I, I made them. He wanted to get up and go somewhere, but I asked my husband to please sit down and go through the PowerPoint with me. And um, I have quite a list of what he needs to make, Stay, he, he wants made, everything he wants made. And some things are gonna be easier because most of you know I am allergic to dairy but I've already come up with a workaround for the baked pasta. <laughs> and so, and I think I was telling Jill when we first started about, you know, I think I can do that because um, I'm also allergic to iodine. Instead of tuna, I can do shredded chicken. And of course you can buy anything vegan these days. And so there are vegan mayonnaises. So like Gina, who's tasted these before, these tortonis, um, my my grandfather's mother's recipe. She was born in Czechoslovakia, got married and moved to Vis, 
which is in Yugoslavia. It is now a part of Croatia off the Dalmatian coast. This is her recipe. But while my sister was alive, she would not, um, she did not want me to share this recipe, but I'm gonna share it with you. It's the first time I've actually shared it with anybody. Tortonis are frozen. They're in little tiny cupcake containers. And when I make them, this is a recipe for a dozen. I usually make six dozen because that's how fast they would go at a party. So you've got what you need here. I put it all there on my counter for you to see. It's egg whites, granulated sugar, whipping cream, vanilla, semi-sweet chocolate morsels, butter, toasted almonds, and paper cupcake cups. Next slide, please. So you're gonna, metal bowls are gonna be the best because they stay the coolest. You're gonna beat the egg white until it's stiff and add half of the sugar until it's like nice and, and satiny. And then in the other bowl, make sure you clean your beaters first. If you only have one set of beaters, you're going to whip your, your whipping cream and then add the rest of the sugar and, um, let it, and the vanilla and let it beat a little longer until it's kind of stiff. Next slide, please. You're gonna fold these mixtures together. You're gonna put them in the freezer, cover it with foil. I found that um, when I do the recipe times six, it takes maybe four to five hours for it to half freeze. But this time I only did one recipe that makes a dozen. It was done in about two hours that I felt that I could confidently take that out and put hot ingredients inside it. So then I just put the almonds, I chopped them up with a big knife, put them on a piece of foil in the, the oven, let them be in there for at 350 for about 10 minutes and toasted them a little bit. And I put those in that frozen mixture. Next slide, please. In the meantime, I use a double boiler. You're gonna melt some of the, the butter, not some, of, all of the butter to ask for and the chocolate morsels in your double boiler and you're gonna immediately start putting it into that frozen mixture. And you can see it makes a very pretty picture. The chocolate starts freezing immediately and splintering. Next picture, please. Until it looks like the picture that's on the left of your screen. And then you fill it in the little cupcake things and put them in the freezer. Now, if you're making a lot, because I was talking about 72 before, I make them and I put them all in the freezer at the same time in these little cupcake things. And then you can take them out, and put them in the boxes that you would like put a shirt in for Christmas or something, a gift box. You can usually get three dozen Tortonis in one of those boxes and get them into your freezer and cover them up because you wanna make sure they stay covered because like anything else that's gooey, like ice cream or something else, it will get soft on top if you don't keep it covered in the freezer. So that tray that you see, I couldn't touch them. Next slide, please. And, um, but you can see that Spider-Man came to my house. <laughs> he ate them all in about three days time. He enjoyed them very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very good. They're very rich. You eat them with a spoon. And um, at the holiday time, my grandmother took this recipe and she would add just a little bit of peppermint extract to the chocolate before she mixed it up. So it became a chocolate peppermint type of thing. And I always meant to try orange extract with it too, because I like chocolate orange, but unfortunately, I will never know if that works, but maybe one of you will try it and tell me if it does. So that's the end of the Tortonis. Thank you, Sonia, for getting all of those out on that today for us. We're gonna open for questions now, Sonia, if you want to take care of that, we have about 10 minutes left, maybe a little less. Okay, fantastic. Does anyone have questions for our ladies? Yes, Yvonne has a question. Unmute, please. You're muted. Sorry. 
Wendy, can you use Persian cucumbers instead of regular cucumbers? You know, uh, yeah, you, yes, you could, if, if that's your choice. But um, that's, that's only if you want to expand the salad. But, um, you know, it's kind of up to you what, what you like. Um, one of my sons likes alternate cucumbers and, and the other doesn't even like cucumbers. So many times we're doing just green beans and tomatoes uh, and, and maybe other things on the side just to put in as a last ingredient. But yeah, you can Thank use you. whichever one you like. Thank you, Wendy. Our next question comes from Sherry. Sherry, if you'll tell us who you're addressing just like she did, and then they'll know to unmute to answer. Mm, I lost her. Where'd she go? What did you ask me to do? Uh, un just tell who you're asking the question to oh. so that they can unmute as you're asking your question. Wendy, it's a question for Wendy. Yes, ma'am. Um, I missed it. Why do you cut off the piece of cucumber and rub the rest of the cucumber with it? Because you don't want to have a bitter cucumber. And it's an old trick. And by the way, it works for zucchini as well. Uh, many times, now, a lot of times when you're growing cucumbers or zucchini for yourself, you may not get a bitter one. But there's nothing worse than having a cucumber that has a bitter taste to it. And I automatically cut it off, rub it, and it, whether I'm doing zucchini or cucumber every time. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Sherry. The next question comes from Terry. Terry, you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, I do. My, my question is for, I believe it's Sonia. Uh, Matisse, and it was her Oma's recipe. I was wondering how, if she, if she knows how old that recipe is. I know that she said her family can trace back um, a few centuries. Does she know how, um, when that recipe came, came about? No, I, I think um, variations of it, you know, I, I would have to say several hundred years, you know, of, I noticed there's a, um, some people don't, I mean, you, you kind of vary it as to what you, what you like, but I, I really don't know, but it's a good question. And I will, I will just have to ask the relatives. We were there a couple of years ago to first time for me to see the, the town my husband grew up in. Uh, he actually was born in Poland. It was occupied Germany at the time. So he hadn't been back since they came. He was four years old and he's just turned 77 so um it was an experience going back there but i i didn't ask that question it's i at least that i know of for 55 years so it's it's much longer than that it was something his mother had 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 done it was it's just a very common it sounds like a very it's a very hearty meal really thank you it's a, it sounds wonderful I, i'm just fascinated when recipes go back in history in quite a few centuries. I was just uh, wondering, thank you so much. And oh, I look forward to trying to prepare it myself someday. Oh, you'll be glad you did. Thank you, thank you Sonia. The next question comes from Sylvia. Sylvia has a question. Hi there. Oh goodness, I have my picture up there. Hang on a second, I don't know how to get this now. Now I'm in my picture, Lordy, I'm a hot mess today. So I tried to get here on time. In time on my mind was 3.30. I came in at 3.20 and I realized, holy crap, it started at three. And so I didn't get to see all the recipes. I wondered if you're sharing all the recipes or if uh, I'm out of luck. Yes, that one can go to Pam, but from what I understand, you will get a packet with all of the recipes in it. Ooh, that's fabulous. We, yeah. Thank we you made a so PDF much. of the entire PowerPoint, and I've already sent it to Lynn, and Lynn sent me something saying she can open it, and so she will send it out to all of you. Oh my goodness, thank you guys. This is so And you cool. have to let us know if you try it. We're, you know, we want to know. I will. <laughs> yeah, take a photo and send it in for Facebook so we can start putting it out there. Great. Okay, so the next one is Brenda. Brenda has a question. 
Brenda, can you unmute, love? Just hit your space bar. Are you on a computer? Okay, I'm going to ask her to unmute. Um, and that will take a minute. So let's move to Rita. Rita, you had a, oh, there you are, Brenda. You're unmuted. Very nice. Okay. Uh, do you peel those vegetables, Wendy, when you rub the top on it? You know, um, I, I don't peel the cucumber until I've already rubbed it. Okay. For some reason. Um, zucchini, uh, if I'm cooking zucchini, the green Italian. Um, I don't. I don't peel it. I just cook okay. it and slice it. Okay. But I do. I do cut the the That's one okay. the end of you know where I've rubbed it. I do make a small slice there and get rid of that as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next question or comment comes from Rita. Rita. Hi. My question to Cindy Sanders. On your apricot cobbler, you don't say how many, or maybe you do, but I don't see it, like a cup worth of apricots, or I'm going to try to use peaches, so I'm just wondering how much, and also you say bake at 350 until the filling is bubbling and golden. How long is that usually? It really depends, Rita. Some people use frozen filling. A lot of times, you know, if it's not apricot season, my filling is frozen. It's coming out of the freezer. So it takes a little bit longer time. Typically, it takes about 45 minutes would be the minimum. And then what you do is you just fill your pan halfway of fruit. So everyone, you know, everyone's pan is a little bit different. The other thing that you can do is you can double the recipe and use a nine by 12 Pyrex pan. You can triple the recipe. If you have a lot of people come in, you have a bigger pan. So I really kind of left it at the eight by eight and the, the smaller version. So you just fill your pan halfway with whatever prepared fruit filling, then sprinkle the dry ingredients on top, drizzle the butter, bake it. And it's about a minimum of 45 minutes, typically for an eight by eight. And then you kind of have to adjust up from there, depending on the size of your pan and whether or not your fruit is frozen or um, at room temperature. Thank you so okay. much. We have Thank time you. for one more question and that's going to be Sandra. Sandra, you have one more question? Uh, same thing for Cindy. Uh, Cindy on the Africa cobbler, there's actually no uh, pie crust on the bottom? It's no, ma'am. Okay. No, it's just on the top. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, back Enjoy. To you, Pam. Thank you, Cindy. Back to you, Pam. You really have to tell us if you start making these because these all sound so wonderful. They really do. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, Barbara, do you have any last words? Just want to tell them thanks for being here. We had a good time with you all. Thank you. Yes. Sonia Holtz, any last words? Yes, I just want to remind everyone, please send your photos, your articles, and your stories to cfwccommunications at gmail.com. Um, we would love to see if you make the recipes. We'd love you to take photos. We'd love to share this with everyone that's um, partaking in this and really inspire each other to get into it and have fun with it. Um, yes. And I want to thank you for your support on the Facebook page and also Quick Bites. Our numbers are going up. So congratulations, everyone. Back to you, Pam. Um, Lynn Youngstrom, do you have any announcements? Uh, we have two more workshops in this month, and they are both open. If you have not registered or you don't have a link, please send a request to um, reservationcfwc at gmail.com and I will get a link right out to you. Thank you. So ladies, once again, this will be on Facebook. The recording is available. Um, I I don't know what happened with the recording. I noticed that it was off. 
with the very beginning. And so I turned it on. And so hopefully we have everything there, but you get what you get. And you know, computers are a little kind of a strange thing. We know that um, they sometimes have a mind of their own when you touch buttons. Anyway, um, I know that we got a good three quarters of today on there. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on Friday, which is, I believe, a communications, is it smartphone pictures? Smartphone. It is. It's all about yeah. okay, um, smartphone pictures how to, and how to take a better photo and how to videotape with your, your smartphones. So we'll see you back then. And until that time, stay well, be happy, and cook. I love cooking. I think all of you do, too. So enjoy. Bye. Thank Cindy, you. I can't wait to do the apricot cobbler. I'm looking.